There we go. Just take a second. I'd love to see your dog too. I've seen your pictures. He's right, right here. here. We'd love to see your dog. Let, let me introduce you first. Hey, okay. everybody. <laughs> We love pets on this show. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is day seven of Main Street Vegan Academy a week, and for the last six days, we featured some of the over 500 wonderful graduates from Main Street Vegan Academy. What is Main Street Vegan Academy, <laughs> you may wonder? Well, I didn't know either, and we're going to find out a little bit more about it today and also talk about really fun things like aging well, yoga, spirituality. My guest is Victoria Moran. Hey, Chef AJ, what a fun week this has been. I know, and you got me thinking that maybe I could do these weeks for other you know, other like ventures. That'd like I was thinking, great. Because I, I contacted Cyrus and Robbie. I said, hey, you guys want to do Mastering Diabetes Week with some of your people? And I contacted yeah. the Lifestyle Medicine Institute. So thanks for, uh, once again, setting a trend. <laughs> oh, that's I, a great idea. And you're yeah. so creative in, in filling all this airtime with stuff that is so good. I know. I, it's it's like I want to be, every day. if I had more time, I'd broadcast 24 hours a day and I'd be like, my mom would be all vegan all the time. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, so tell us about Main Street Vegan Academy. Cause I, yeah. I love people found things like me, like, yeah. you know, like, like invent things. And, and <laughs> what, wh when did you start it? Why did you start it? How did you start it? How yeah. are you managing now doing it online and how uh, do people find out more about it? Sure. Okay. Well, way back in December of 2010, it's like history. I went to a PETA fundraiser and anybody who's got any interest in the ethical side of this way of eating and living, you know, we've all seen those videos and they're awful. Well, I'd been seeing videos like that for 30 years by then. So I didn't know that I would be affected, but for some reason, my heart was extra open that night. And I just want to do a little aside about open heartedness. I was remembering from years ago when I first met Dr. Dean Ornish, who was kind of the first to do what we think of as a whole food plant-based diet, you know, not 100% uh, vegan, but pretty darn close. And his interest in all of this originally came from yoga and his fabulous, big, best-selling book, Dr. Dean Ornish's Program for Reversing Heart Disease, that was the title Random House gave it. Dr. Ornish wanted to call it opening your heart because it's really about opening the heart in that physical way that prevents and reverses heart disease. But it's also about opening our heart in this kind of spiritual way and opening our heart to other beings. So that night, back in 2010, my heart was way open. And coming home in the subway in New York City, I just, I wanted to write, PETA a check for $100,000, but it would have bounced. So I'm talking to my higher power and got this very clear message. You need to write a book and call it Main Street Vegan. It needs to have 40 little chapters, a recipe at the end of each one. And it needs to be geared to the young woman that you were in Wheaton, Illinois, back in 1983, when you finally managed to make it all the way to vegan. And it was just like, okay, I'm taking notes here. So that book um, proposal was written, found a publisher, actually, interestingly enough, Random House. And they said, we really want to work with you. We want this book, but we hate Main Street. And I'm like, okay, except I know that's supposed to be the title. And I may have told this story on your show before, but it's just to me, it's what happened. I'm walking up Broadway and there is Michael Moore, who had read one of my earlier books. And Lo and behold, we start talking, we start talking about food and that kind of thing. And one night I mentioned that the book I was writing was supposed to be called Main Street Vegan and the publisher hated that. And he said, they're wrong. Let me talk to them. So in a three-way call with an Academy Award winner and my editor and me, I got that title. And when the editor called two days after this phone call to say, okay, it's Main Street Vegan, it was like I have these 
these comic book bubbles popping all around. There needs to be a Main Street Vegan radio show. I don't think I even knew the word podcast back then. There needs to be a, a Main Street uh, Vegan production company so you can do documentaries. There needs to be Main Street Vegan Academy training and certifying vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. So basically, I just said, okay, which is another kind of thing that I'm about. That is when life hands you opportunities, inspirations, ideas, they're handing it to you. If they wanted somebody else to do it, they would have handed it to them. So I'm like, okay, I got these ones. And so I just decided I would do the academy. Now, what was curious at that time was even though I had been vegan for many years and, and I had for a long time written for Vegetarian Times and you know all that, but that was kind of historic. And professionally, I had been more in the spirituality world and I'd been on Oprah a couple of times for that kind of book. And so when I put the Academy out there, I didn't have a big following in the vegan slash plant-based world, but I just figured, okay, <laughs> do it. And lo and behold, 13 amazing people um, showed up in New York City for the very first class in, in June of 2012. And we did it that way for the first 29 classes. And then the pandemic happened and we put it on Zoom. And I thought, oh, the magic, magic will go away. It's so magical to come to New York City and be with the people and get to meet the faculty and go on field trips and go out to eat. Well, you know what? It's magic on Zoom. We had the most incredible class this summer. And then we had a master class for, for graduates. Another class is starting at the end of February. So what we do at Main Street Vegan Academy, whether it's on Zoom or in person, is is certify, train and certify vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. So just to clarify where we fit in all the amazing programs that are out there, and there's so many just stunning uh, educational opportunities for people who are interested in, in this entire world. And as far as I'm concerned, as much time and resources as you have, <laughs> you know, take everything. That's certainly my philosophy. I am just going to school all the time. But at Main Street Vegan Academy, what we want to, to help people to become is total experts on the whole vegan landscape. So our dietary, our nutritional courses are all whole food plant-based. And we add on to that uh, the animal rights issues, the environmental issues, and the history of, of the vegan and vegetarian movement. That's all in our vegan principles area. And then we have communication principles so that you can actually get out and do this professionally or otherwise in terms of coaching principles, how to do it, public speaking, working with mixed and transitional families, working with people with weight issues um, and emotional eating, food addiction, all that. Then we have business principles because the majority of people who come here want to do this as a business. For a few people, it really is a complete full time. This is how we make our living. But everybody just about is doing something in the promoting veganism world. So we have classes about vegan business and where you fit, about how to get into that business mindset and how to turn what you do into an actual functioning uh, business that you get to make money on and pay taxes on and <laughs> really be out there in the world doing it. And some of our businesses are businesses as if it's mine, but um, there's Cat Mendenhall, Cowboy Boots in, in Dallas. Uh, JL Fields uh, has the Colorado Springs Vegan Cooking Academy. There is V Marks the Shop Bodega in Philadelphia, Bomo Ice Cream in uh, Mexico City. There is a beautiful Fromagerie on the Lower East Side of Manhattan called Riverdell, uh, vegan cheeses. So just all kinds of things, culinary and otherwise, that uh, people come here and get excited and get inspired, and then they go out there and do. And I'm just so proud of them. That's just such a cool legacy. Not that you're going anywhere, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, when you get to be my age, it's good to see your legacy building. It's very gratifying. 
And your age is almost 71. I know you don't mind people because right. every time you turn a year older, so we're, we're like a day <laughs> apart. We both, my 60th and your 70th, we were supposed to celebrate at grand events yeah. with lots of people and the pandemic had other plans. Yes. And so that's kind of how this show got created. It was like just asking friends to come on. I had no idea people would be interested and certainly watch every day. So see, in a way, you're all, you always have your hand in creating something magical for people. Well, you too. And I was thinking about that this morning when I knew we were going to be talking together today that we are both Aries and I know not everybody puts much stock in astrology, but it is interesting that in some ways our personalities are very different, but in other ways we've got this core Aries sisterhood <laughs> that, that we're really comfortable going out there into the world and taking risks and taking chances and hoping people like it and just, you know, being okay if they don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, and I'm the same way. You know, I I always remember that saying: you you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And mm -hmm. so I'd rather just take a chance and fail than not try because it's you know that's just yeah. our just just our way. But Absolutely. you you know, right before we started, because we met your pigeon all week, and he's he's welcome to come back, Thunder. But I never hear seen him. It. He's cooing. Not yet. Okay, but, good. <laughs> but I've never seen your. I know you have a dog too, but I've never yeah, seen your dog. Four. You know what? I think maybe the best thing is just to turn. Let's see if I can do this. Oh. Can you see Forbes? You there have to talk. he is. Now, Forbes is very interesting on the whole food plant-based thing because he has to be whole food plant-based because he is a schnoodle, schnauzer, poodle, rescue, of course. And the schnauzer half of him is prone to a condition called pancreatitis, which means that he can't eat very much fat. And so um, we've been, you know, really struggling because he's a picky eater and that. And we're just so happy that a brand new fresh vegan food is available here in New York City. It's called Bramble, which is named for the longest lived dog ever, who was a vegan border collie, I believe in the UK. So uh, yeah, so he's eating Bramble and doing great. That's neat. That's very cute. Thank you. Yeah, nice. So how are you aging so well? I, I, know, I know it's partly veganism, but I think it's partly you, you, your attitude and there, cause that's, oops, we're, I'm having a little trouble. 60 was hard. I'm noticing lines and things that, you know, yeah. I don't want to, I mean, it's, I'm not against surgery. It's just, I'm a, I'm a chicken. That's basically uh. it. It's basically it. I'm just too chicken. Yeah. Well, um, there's a wonderful uh, plant-based dermatologist here in New York City. I don't know if you've had her on your show yet, Dr. Jessica Krant. Uh, only like four times. Four times. And one's okay. on the sun. Maybe she well, come on every month. She's so popular. You she is. So well, lucky. she's she's wonderful, and she's got a great attitude about it too. Because, you know, women look at aging, and men too. But you know, for men, oh my goodness, you know, they go gray, and then they're just distinguished. Uh, you know, they get wrinkles. It's like, oh my God, he's so craggy and sexy. It's like, when did anybody ever say she's so craggy and sexy? Um, <laughs> so there's they're still a double standard. And so I think we just have to take it in our own hands and do with it as we will. Probably some of the aging thing or the cosmetic part of aging has to do with heredity. And so, you know, in some ways we're going to get what we get, but we celebrate who we are. I think it's the same thing of any age. So let's say you're young and you've got something that you don't like. Your nose is too big, your lips are too thin, your eyes are too close together or far apart or, you know, whatever it is. You know, particularly, I think young women just criticize themselves so much and compare themselves against some kind of, of perfection, which changes. And one of the cool things about being my age is that within my lifetime, I have seen like three shifts in what's ideal. And that is really great because when you've only been around for one ideal, you assume that it's the only ideal. So when I was a little girl, the ideal was kind of the va 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 voom, you know, Marilyn Monroe kind of thing. But then when I was a teenager and it really mattered, the ideal was twiggy you know, straight up and down, skinny as a rail, what we would now call anorexic, but we then called beautiful. <laughs> and then it became this athletic thing, except with very large breasts. And it's like the 
chances that you're going to have that ectomorphic, long, lean, skinny body and, and be a 38 double D. I mean, it's just like that does not happen in nature, <laughs> but it's, you know, was happening about 15 years ago. And now I think we are getting a lot more realistic and you see a lot more, you know, different body types out in the world. And that, that helps some, I don't know that we're quite there with age. We have the kind of over 50 models, but they all look just alike. Just like with the younger models, I remember, oh, this was a while ago, maybe 15 years ago when we still had lots of magazines and newsstands. And my husband and I were at a newsstand and he, he kind of scanned over the magazines and he said, are those different women on all those magazines or is it the same one? <laughs> Cause they really did all look alike. They all had the blonde hair, you know, down to here and the cleavage and with the over 50 kind of look, you know, she's, she's tall and slender. Like she was one of those other models back then. And she has this incredible thick gray hair, probably with extensions, but whatever. I don't know that I'm ever going to go gray. I just never seem to like feel motivated to do that. I haven't been motivated yet, but but I'm jealous of those women who's, you know, they could do this white, fabulous mane. It's all so great, except it's not great that we have to fit into somebody else's mold. And one of the great things that happens right around 50-ish with, with menopause and women is that we stop feeling so much that we have to meet somebody else's standards. And we get just a little bit kind of spicier and more willing to be who we are. Now, 60s, I want to tell you, AJ, young sister, AJ, the 60s are phenomenal. That It is a great decade. You're in one of the best decades of life because you're really grown up, you're mature, you know what's up, but you are still young, vibrant, beautiful, and healthy. And I have to say for me, 70 was kind of weird. It happened during the pandemic, which of course made everything just odd. I didn't know what to do with myself because I couldn't go anywhere. So I went out to walk my dog and the garage attendant in the basement was playing Zumba, Zumba music. And so I just did Zumba dancing for a while in the garage, probably breathing horrible fumes through my mask. But you know, you do what you have to do. But I have to say it was very weird, especially because they started saying, now, COVID doesn't seem to be all that dangerous, generally speaking for young people. But you know, if you're over 70, it's deadly. Or I heard one person early on in the pandemic say, this virus is the grim reaper for the elderly. And it's like, good grief, I just got to be elderly and the grim reaper is after me already. I mean, it happened like yesterday. So, so it's been a little bit tricky, but what has really helped me is that having some, I don't wanna quite say extra time because I work like crazy and have been working so much during the pandemic, but I'm not traveling. So I've been close enough to home that I've been able to study some things that I have been interested in for years, but haven't been able to delve into deeply. And so I've done a lot of study in yoga, a lot of study in Ayurveda, which for anybody who's unfamiliar, it, it's this Indian healthcare system that grew up alongside yoga. It translates as the science of life, or sometimes you'll hear people say the science of long life. And and with the, the two of these, this spiritual teaching and this physical teaching that has a real spiritual basis, I've gotten so much more peaceful with the whole thing of 70s. And the reality is, you know, I remember turning 60 and it wasn't that long ago, which means that when I turn 80, it's not going to be that long from now. And 80 is, woo, it's a whole big thing. And yet it's like, right now is this day. And right now I'm on the Chef AJ show and I am talking to people and I have energy and I have health and I have gratitude. And that's my reality right now. And my, my prayer is that at some point when I don't have all those things, I'll still have the gratitude. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Is that what your next book's about? <laughs> You know, I keep going back and forth with the, the next book. 
it will be number 14 for me. And the last three have been strictly in the vegan world. But before that, most of my books were about spirituality. Uh, my biggest book was called Creating a Charmed Life. And it was a really charmed book. <laughs> I mean, it sold like all these copies and then it went into 30 languages. And I'm just really feeling strongly that I want to be back there with, of course, the vegan thing running through all of it. Because to me, veganism and spirituality are hand in glove. It's like, I know a lot of people claim to be spiritual and they eat, you know, anybody that they can catch. But to me, that's, that's just not it. You know, we've, we've got to have this love and compassion at the core of, of who we are in order to really be at, at peace with our soul. So I'm, uh, I'm writing every day. I have a wonderful writing coach, and I'm going to recommend her as a, a writer and a coach if anybody out there is a writer. Her name is Camille DeAngelis, and her website is Comet Party, cometparty.com. And actually, Camille is a graduate of Main Street Vegan Academy. She's mostly a young adult author. She's got all kinds of wonderful books for young people. One of them is called Bones and All about a teenage cannibal. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, but she's also done a nonfiction like um, uh, what, a bright, clean mind, which is about vegans and creativity, um, visual artists, performers, writers, all kinds of people like that. So anyway, I've been working with her and I'm writing every single day and I'm not prepared to say what the book exactly is because I'm not sure yet what it exactly is, but it's going to be very spirited. Nice. You know, Why, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I always think there's certain people like that I kind of, well, I don't want to say put on a pedestal, but like there's people that I, I, I respect lots of people in the vegan movement, almost everybody that anybody that's vegan, I, I'm appreciative, but people like you and Colleen Patrick Rudro and Miyoko, I call her Saint Miyoko. You have like this quality <laughs> that I feel like I don't have. And I don't think that I'm so much of an angry vegan, but you guys have more, I guess maybe more compassion or like a John Pierre, you know, and I always wanted to know how to get that because I do get angry that people eat animals and that they hurt animals and that they think it's okay, you know, and that's been the hardest part of me being vegan for 43 years. And it's, it's funny because I get a lot of hate from vegans, you know, because I'm too thin or I had, you know, Dr. David Katz on the show and Dr. Walt Willis. I love Dr. David of Katz. Course, but the he thing taught is, for the master class of Main Street Vegan Academy. He's just. Yeah, but oh, he's not really, you know, if you're not 100%, you know, how dare I have, you know, Elaine LaLanne, a legend on my show. They're not vegan. Why am I talking to these people? And it's like, how do you answer that, you know? Well, I think that, and, and I learned this really in, in my study of, of religions. I mean, that's my, my academic background is comparative religions. And it seems that there are in, in all over the world, whatever religion people espouse or none, you've got your orthodox and you've got your like mystical. You know, so you've got the people, whether we're talking diet or whatever, these are the rules and this is how I do it. So this is the way it has to be for everybody on earth all the time, the end. Ugh. And then you've got, hmm, wow, that's interesting. Hmm, I'm going to look at that. And that does not mean that those people over here that are a little bit more curious are not completely sticking to their values. I think it is absolutely important for all of us that whether we're talking about morality or, or food choices or whatever it is, that we have a line that we will not cross. And there's no rule that says that line has to be the same place for all people. But I do think we have to allow for people being somewhere that we're not. I mean, 44 years ago, you weren't vegan. 38 years ago, I wasn't vegan. And so, you know, did that mean we were just doomed? <laughs> Evidently not, not in the vegan way anyhow. So yeah, I think, and I think the other thing, Chef AJ, tell me what you think about this. For those of us who are very involved in, in the vegan world or the plant-based world, we kind of start to think there are more of us than there are. 
And it's wonderful that there's all this stuff out there, you know, there's the Beyond Burger and there's the Just Egg and there's, you know, somebody had an IPO and all that's so vegan is out there in the world in a way that it didn't used to be. And yet we're still just a tiny little percentage of the population. The time will come when we've got a critical mass and then it's going to be a lot easier. But right now, you know, we're still seen as fringe by a lot of people. So I think we need to celebrate every step somebody takes. Anybody who says, I'm doing Meatless Monday, I started buying almond milk. Guess what? I tried kale. It's like, woohoo, good for you. And, and not like, yes, but you know, you are killing animals and clogging your arteries the rest of the time. You know what? Give them a chance because <laughs> nobody likes being pushed into anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, the abolitionists are like, you know, it's my way or the highway, 100% or nothing. And it's like most of them weren't born vegan as far as I know. Right. Yeah. Well, then then it's the highway because, yeah. you know, we, we have to live in the world as it is. And I remember my big um, inspiration for being vegan was Jay Dinshaw, co-founder of the American Vegan Society. And I always tell everybody, join the American Vegan Society, because it hardly costs anything to join. And they were there before anybody else. They were keeping this thing alive. So everybody who thinks that this started with PETA or, or with, with Dean Ornish or anything like that, or John Robbins, no, it started way before them, 1960. I mean, when I think about that, it's like, 1960, that was practically the 50s. Who would have thought that this country needed a vegan society? Well, Jay Dinshaw thought we did. And he would always say, this is about doing the most good and the least harm that you can do in any situation. And to me, if you study philosophy, East or West, that's really the essence of moral philosophy. We're going through this life. It's not easy for anybody the best we can do is the best we can. And I'm also a really big believer in what I call attraction activism. That like they say in the 12 step programs, if you have something somebody wants, they're gonna do what you did to get it. And so if your life is good, if you improved your health, if you're nice and you get along with people and you're doing some good for others, people will see that and they'll say, wow, and you know what she eats? yeah, she eats all this natural food, nothing from an animal. I don't know that I would ever do that, but it sure works for her. And that's powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that if everybody ate 90% fewer animals, it would be a lot better position than if just a handful of people were 100%. You know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. Of course. And, and it gets it gets very confusing. My husband is in school. Uh, he'll be ordained this spring as an interfaith minister. And, and he started on this quest. He calls himself a recovering lawyer. And, and he started in, in this, this religious education to see what the world's religions had to say about non-human beings. And, and through that, it turned out that one of his mentors at the school was also vegan, Reverend Sarah Bowen, who wrote a book called uh, uh, Spiritual Rebel <laughs> and, uh, or Spiritually Rebellious. I'm not sure. Pardon me, Sarah, if I didn't say your title right. And, um, and uh, Reverend um, Eric Allison. And they're going to be starting, and I'm part of it too, even though I'm not a reverend of anything, um, the Compassion Consortium, which is a, a spiritual home for people who are vegans or people who care about animals, or they're maybe looking at being vegan, but they feel like in their church, their synagogue, their mosque, their ashram, whatever it is, that side of themselves, that side of enlarged compassion isn't being recognized. Or then, of course, a lot of people just left spiritual communities for, for that very reason. So uh, we want to be there for them for that. And part of, of what we're about is consistency. And yet, on the other hand, openness. So we're putting together our advisory board. And it's like, well, we don't want somebody in our advisory board, certainly who eats meat. But on the other hand, if somebody is just cosmic and wonderful and fabulous, and has some ghee every now and then for cultural whatever, we're not going to say no to that either. So I think you know, I know I, I had, I had, a, I had a wonderful doctor on the show and, and she was vegan, except for that for medicinal purposes. And, and like, you wouldn't believe that she, I just, it's just these people drive me crazy, but I want, I hear somebody that isn't driving me crazy. I want to <laughs> thank 
a vegan trucker lady for her super chat. And she says, you, you're both so gorgeous on the inside. It comes out. Thank you so oh, much. Bless you. Yeah. So there are a lot of nice people. Oh, yeah. They, I, that people can't believe that you're 70. You're actually, you'll be 71 in about six weeks. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I just, and, and one thing I notice, you know, those numbers, they only go in one direction, <laughs> wow. but I, I wrote a book called younger by the day back in the early uh, 2000s. And it was because I had turned 50. Now I had trouble with 50 AJ. Maybe I have trouble with odd numbers, mm. but um, you know, the fives and the sevens as a <laughs> <laughs> to the sixes and the fours. But um, yeah, I was 53. And it's like, I, 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 I'm no, 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 let's just stop right here. You know, let's just not get any older. So I wrote this book called Younger by the Day. It's a really good book. It's a day book. And yet it's kind of ridiculous, because we're not going to get younger. But what we can get is more youth filled because there are a lot of young people who are really old and i think especially now bless their hearts because they have so much on them i mean they're looking at climate change they're looking at at all of the the oppression that previous generations you know scooped out and they're trying to fix it so i think there's a kind of of overwhelming agedness that can happen to the young, especially now. But what we have an opportunity to, to do is to identify with that part of us that doesn't age. And something that I am thinking about for my new book, maybe I'll tell a little more than I, I thought. Um, I want to be, as I get older, like some of the wonderful role models that I have had all my life for growing older. So when I was young, I was around a lot of older women. At one point, I lived and worked at the Theosophical Society in America, which is a spiritual organization. And I worked in the library and learned all kinds of cool stuff. Now, lest anybody think that I was a child saint, the reason that I was there was because I was a practicing binge eater and I gained so much weight so fast, I was embarrassed to stay in my hometown. So I moved away so that people wouldn't see my body. That's how I ended up at the spiritual organization. But anyway, I was there in the library learning all this great stuff. And there was a woman who, who worked there because everybody there was either under 25 or over 65 because it was basically volunteer work. And, you know, I'd complain about whatever, couldn't get my typewriter ribbon in or, you know, the complaints we had in 1970. And her name was Iris. And she had this fabulous white hair and braids around her head. And I remember once I complained about something like that. And she goes, the darling physical plane. Now, that would sound really stupid if you weren't into yoga or theosophy or something like that, where they talk about there are all these planes of being and the physical is kind of the lowest and the densest and the most difficult. But just it wasn't what she said so much as how she said it. It was this beautiful acceptance of life on earth. It can drive you crazy if you let it. But instead, when she said that, she just lit up like a sunrise. And I just knew when I am 86, I want to be just like Iris. So I think that's another kind of, I don't like that term anti-aging, but we all know what it means. Anti-aging tip <laughs> is to find some people who are older than you and just say, I want to do what that person does because I want what that person's got. Nice. Kathy wanted to know if your husband is vegan. Oh, he is. Yeah, he wasn't when, when I married him. So I was married um, when I was young and, and ha had my daughter married to a wonderful, wonderful man who passed away. And then I was dating, but only spiritual vegetarians. That was like the criteria. But what I found is the spiritual vegetarians it tended to be kind of sensitive <laughs> and it's not so much like that now, but you know, back then we're talking the eighties, it was unusual even to be vegetarian, much less vegan. And so I finally thought, you know what? I'm just going to date somebody I like. I don't care what he eats. I don't care what he believes because after all, and this is funny, I'm 46. I'm so old. Nobody's ever going to marry me. So I'm dating this guy 
because he was good looking and interesting and he'd lived around the world. He'd never met a vegetarian, much less a vegan and her vegan kid until <laughs> my daughter and I showed up in his life. Um, and he was very sweet about it. And so the first couple of weeks we dated, you know, we would go out to uh, Italian restaurants, Mexican restaurants, that kind of thing. And he'd eat, you know, certainly vegetarian, close to vegan. And then when it started to kind of heat up, he said, um, we're going on a special date. And he took me to the sports bar, which is like, what? I'm supposed to eat with televisions on? I mean, I was just like, oh my God, this is not going to work. And then he ordered a steak and he didn't even have the decency to ask for it. Well done. So this bloody awful thing comes to the table. And I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, it was a nice two weeks. (laughs) I'm glad I didn't get into this any deeper. And the next morning he called and he said, I've been thinking about our relationship. And I thought I have too, buddy. It's not going anywhere. He said, I've decided I'm not going to eat meat anymore. Well, that whole thing with the sports bar and the bloody steak was like a test to see if I was going to go nutsy cuckoo. Um, And, and I've always, my, I, it's like, people are going to do what they're going to do. I'm going to be an example. Well, obviously I was. So that was when he stopped eating meat. Still the vegan thing was like out, you know, left field somewhere. Like you don't kill cows to get milk. Well, of course we know you do. But anyway, so he was off like that. But then we went to a farm sanctuary benefit and they showed a little tiny video. The power of video is just so strong. And it, it said, um, you know, what really happens And he leaned across the table and he said, do you think we could start getting more of that milk like you drink? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And inside I'm like, yes. And then, uh, and that was like 2004 and he was virtually vegan, but he wasn't like carrying signs. And then 2011, Main Street Vegan was in manuscript form and he read the manuscript on a train when he went to visit his mom. And he called me from the train and said, okay, now I get it. Now I'm vegan. And it was so cool to see him divest himself of all his leather. And he's really private. He's, he's, he doesn't want, he doesn't like social media. And and he he calls himself the amazing Google-less man because he likes that you can hardly find him anywhere. But he said, okay, for this occasion, I have gotten rid of, you know, all the belts, all the shoes, and my two wallets, I have now two vegan wallets, and this makes me completely vegan. You can put that on Facebook. I don't think he's ever told me I could put anything on Facebook since. So yes, he is very vegan and um, actually wrote um, a screenplay that I still hope will one day see the light of day. It's called Miss Liberty. It's a fictional story about a cow who escapes from a slaughterhouse. And of course, you know, now he's doing the ministerial thing with um, also animal chaplaincy and animal Reiki. And he's just, he's just sweet as can be. And this is his birthday. Happy Aww. birthday. Really. I'm, I'm sure he probably won't be on the show though, right? He's too private. Oh, he won't be on a show. Oh, my goodness. I mean, he will not be on my podcast, which isn't even video. You know, he doesn't even want his voice out there. Mm, And, you know, it's just like, okay, there's more room for Chef AJ and me and others (laughs) who like being out there. Yeah, it reminds me of Charles a little bit. Uh, Robin says you look uh, so young. What skincare products do you use? Something you get for Dr. Cramp, maybe? Uh, No, actually... I, there have been times in my life when I've been a devotee of a product, but now I just use whatever I get in the Kinder Beauty box. So Kinder Beauty is this wonderful, um, cruelty-free and um, a non-toxic uh, skincare box and some makeup too that comes every month. It was founded by a couple of wonderful vegans, uh, actresses, Daniela Monet and um, Ivana Lynch. And it's so much fun because this box comes every month and you open it up and it's like, whoa, this stuff is so cool. And, you know, some of those boxes just give you little samples and there's not even enough there to know if you like it. But this box gives you full size stuff. So 
you know, I, I just use whatever's in there. And so that means I like to do the two part um, cleansy thing, uh, which some of you probably already know about. I learned it from my stepdaughter who used to be a makeup artist. So you use an oily cleanser first. I use one that's like vitamin B infused and that kind of melts the makeup and everything. And then I do a sudsy cleanser. I've got an Ayurvedic one that I, I'm using now, but if something else comes in the Kinder Beauty box, I'll be using that. And then uh, I don't do the, um, you know, the pH thing, the, the toner, because it seems to dry my skin. So I go right to a serum and, and I get wonderful serums in the Kinder Beauty box. I've got one now. I think it's called I don't know, mad hippie or dirty hippie. I don't know what, I just put it on there. And then, you know, give that some time to sink in. And then at night I do a moisturizer, maybe a retinol, maybe a vegan collagen, something like that. And then in the morning or in the daytime, of course, sunblock. But I have to say that um, the past year with never going out without the mask and the sunglasses, I think that's actually been, you know, a little bit of a boon for skin. I would far rather not be having everybody go through a pandemic and just using lots of sunblock. But, you know, sometimes we have to look for silver linings in whatever there is. And I frankly think I'm going to wear a mask for the rest of my life. Well, you know, it's so funny because I look younger with the mask. I had some young guy hit on me at Sprouts and because, you know, you couldn't see anything. And uh, <laughs> I was like, I, and I was like, like, he goes, are you single? And I'm like, yeah, I go, but I'm also 60. Cause he looked like it was like 30. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with the mask. Plus my mask, I use it as a way to promote veganism. Cause my mask actually says vegan since 1977. And I've met so many wonderful wow. people that might, might not have talked to me without the mask. So I, I'm okay with that. How did you get one customized? I'll, I'll, I'll make one for you if you like. I, I just, I like doing things like that. Ooh, oh, 1983. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll get you a present. Yeah. It's, well, you know, it's so funny because are you familiar with Jasmine Leva who did the invisible? Yes, vegan? of course. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's an Aries like us. So she doesn't oh. take crap from people. And so yeah. she was on the show and, and we were just talking and, you know, just, and she said, you know, veganism isn't just for skinny white girls anymore. And I'm like, would you like a t-shirt like that? And I made her one <laughs> and she put it on Instagram and boy, I wish people hating on her saying she was a racist. And so Aww. John badass vegan and me were defending her because it was just a funny shirt, but people are so. Oh, you like, cannot be funny. I mean, th this to me is, is one of the sad things. I mean, I understand that people who are humorless in this day and age often believe that they're doing it to be helpful to their fellow humans and that's admirable but oh my goodness to think of a humorless world oh uh, yeah no anyway, I, I but I'll, I'll make you a mask for sure because it's a lot you. of fun so a couple thank of questions we have okay. Monica who's in the Netherlands can she get a certification from Main Street Vegan in Europe because it sounds like you're doing it online now yes absolutely and you would not be our first graduate from the Netherlands in fact we had someone in in the zoom class just this summer and we've had actually two people from the Netherlands who have come to New York for what we're now calling the elite class so yeah just go to uh, MainStreetVegan.net and click on Academy and we'd love to have you. New class coming up. Uh, we start February 21st. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and we end like 5 p.m. Eastern time. So, you know, it's a little bit late where you are, but everything's recorded. And if you get tired and have to listen to something recorded afterwards, uh, that's cool. Nice. Let's see. Spirit within the human form known as Christina says, I'm leaning towards a more plant-based diet. Is it expensive to go this route? It can be. That's like saying, I want to get a bachelor's degree. Is it expensive? If you go to NYU, it sure is. But if you go to community college for two years and then go to a state university, it's really cheap. You can probably come out without any debt. And it's the same way in eating this way. So you, you decide Number one, how much do you want to invest in, in eating well for your health? You have to look at your budget and what's available, obviously. Most people can eat this way for what they're spending now or less because of all the stuff we're getting rid of. I mean, we talk about, you know, the animal products are subsidized by the government, so they're cheaper than they ought to be, but they're not that cheap. And then, and cheese is very expensive. And uh, if you also get rid of the junk food, you know, all the soda and, and snack foods and all that kind of thing, you've got all that pile of money just sitting there 
to go in with, um, you know, what was left from the fruits and vegetables and grains and beans and nuts and seeds that you were already eating. So the, the trick is the closer to nature, the closer to vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, you can stay. The the cheaper it's going to be as well as the healthier because every layer of processing adds to cost. And I realize that doesn't really count with fast food and, and super junk food wrapped in cellophane, but that's not food anyway. So that's kind of in, in another category. So, you know, everybody talks about, you know, beans are so cheap and you soak them and they swell up and you get more than you paid for. Okay. We know it. Beans are cheap. Uh, brown rice is cheap and, and relatively black rice and red rice and millet and quinoa and all that stuff. Cheap, 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 very filling. When it comes to fruits and vegetables, obviously you're going to spend a little more if they're organic, but if you get them in season, you're going to be able to eat produce and afford it. And I think the other thing is, if you do find that you can tweak your budget so that you're spending a little bit more on food, that's an investment in your health going forward. And I'm certainly not the first person to say, but it's a really true statement. I would far rather spend the money at the farmer's market than at the hospital. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Smilene says, how has being vegan affected your spirituality? Ooh, what a great question. I think it's made it more consistent. And, you know, I think we all have holes, you know, in our spirituality and, and in, in our, what we can see. And, and that's because, you know, we're not perfect. And so I just feel really grateful that the whole of being eating animals is one that I recognized fairly early on and was able to plug up <laughs> by being vegetarian and eventually vegan. And so I do feel that there's a certain peace kind of within myself and with my higher power simply because I'm doing my very best uh, to do right by everybody else that's here. And that means the animals that I'm not eating and the ones I'm trying to help and take care of and the people, and we all know people are sometimes a lot harder to get along with than animals, <laughs> but you know, we do our best by everybody. Um, and you know, our best is all we can do. And if we don't do very well on something one day, we make amends, get up and start over. So yeah. Thanks for the question. Nice. Roxy asks, does Victoria take any supplements? Yeah, I do. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I've never done the affiliate thing because I like to be able to recommend things without knowing that I'm going to get some money later if somebody, buy, but I finally did it for a product called Complement because it's made by vegans for vegans. And so um, the PhD dietitian, Pamela Ferguson is part of this, uh, Matt Frazier, the no meat athlete, Dr. Joel Kahn. And so the supplement is so cool. Complement Plus, it's called. They originally did one called Complement, uh, which you can still get as, as a spray. And it has vitamin B12, vitamin D3, the fully formed omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, DHA, and vitamin K2. And that's what we know is practically impossible to get in, in a plant-based diet. And of course, vitamin D, and that's impossible to get in any diet because we're supposed to get it from the sun, but most of us don't. And then if you get the complement plus, they've also added to that iodine, selenium, magnesium, and zinc. And I just feel better since I've been taking it. I feel safe. And, and that's all I take. You know, I, I know some people think that the meaning of life is found in bottles at the GNC. I'm not like that, but I do take compliment. And so their website is love compliment. It's the C O M P L E M E N T dot com. And if you put um, main street plus plus sign in all caps in the discount box, you get a discount. And if you don't want to, then don't do that, but you know, check them out anyway. I, mm. I, I really stand by them. Nice. And Maria says, what is the name of the vegan beauty box you were talking about? Kinder Beauty. And it's, it's just so great. And you probably know Jasmine Singer uh, from Our Hen House and, and Veg News. And she's in charge of their website now. I just love it when good people find one another. So it's, it's a great company to support. Plus, it's like, you know, your birthday without getting any older every single month. 
Well, Jasmine's going to be on very soon talking about her new book. So maybe she can talk about that. I think we have time for one more question. I just saw it from Stacy, your lovely graduate who opened the show on Monday. She says the lockdown kind of forced MSVA to make a major change going online. Do you have any plans for the next big thing that MSVA is going to tackle? Ha ha. Well, we're hoping to be in addition, we hope to be online forever because it's so great. And that way we really can be open to people all around the world and people who aren't able to take a week off and come to New York and find a hotel and all that stuff. But we do hope to have uh, in October, and if we can't do it in October, we'll just put it off and do it next spring, um, the MSV Elite Program here in New York City. And the other thing that we're doing is more outreach to and for grads. So one thing we've always been really proud of is what we do afterwards to keep in touch with our graduates and help them. You know, there are people working for animal rights and plant-based organizations that, you know, kind of got there because they came here. And um, we want to start doing monthly events with the graduates so that we can just keep that continuing education going and keep everybody up to date because this, this world, you know, the basics, the basic ethical position, the basics of plant-based nutrition, those things are what they are. But all the stuff that's going on around the world as we grow keeps changing. And to keep up with all of that is very exciting indeed. That is great. Well, thank you so much. It's always great catching up with you. And thank you for the work you do and the people that you inspire. And I'm glad, I'm proud to call myself your airy sister and friend. That goes both ways, Chef AJ. Thank you for this week, and I hope we do it again. Yeah, well, when you think about it, if you have 500 graduates and I need seven per week, (laughs) we could probably do almost a year's worth of shows just with your graduates. Then uh, we will be working toward that. We'll definitely have to do another another Main Street Vegan Academy. We thank you guys so much for watching another. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. I have another special show today at 2 p.m. We're bringing back another previous guest. Her name is Sarah Taylor. She is a vegan author and she is living with brain cancer. And she has such an, I mean, bring your Kleenex. This girl has such a, girl, woman has an amazing attitude towards what she's going through. Yep. Take care, Victoria. Bye-bye.